collision today on the M1 in Dublin. The driver and sole occupant of the van was pronounced dead at the scene of the incident. It happened just before one this afternoon on the northbound side of the road between junctions 3 and 4, Swords and Donabate. Gardaí are appealing for witnesses to contact them, in particular drivers who may have dash cam footage. That's it for now. It's two minutes past eight. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. For our lowest car insurance price guaranteed, go online to theaa.ie. Clear spells and patchy cloud this evening with just some isolated showers. Lowest temperatures tonight of only two degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Monday Night Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now then, you are welcome along. It is Monday Night Rugby. We have ourselves a Champions Cup final, 17th of October, 4.45. Ashton Gate, it will be an Anglo-French affair. Uh, Racing into their third final now. They are desperate to get over the line versus Exeter, very much in their first final after a really brilliant Saturday. Rugby, Racing beating Saracens 19 points to 15. Exeter winners against Toulouse, 28 points to 18. To discuss, we have the man, the myth, the legend. Ron O'Gara, good evening. Hey Joe, how are you? Very well, how are things? Yeah, great. Yeah, all good, thank you. I was looking for a La Rochelle score over the weekend. I didn't see one. Was this a bye week of some kind or did I just make a mess of it? No, you're right, and last weekend. Yeah, so um, there was what Claremont Racing the weekend previously and then obviously uh, Toulouse-Ulster and then this weekend uh, Toulouse obviously semi-final and Racing semi-final. So... Um, I don't think they had in their schedule accounted for a French team getting to the final, but they, as it transpires, Racing play Toulon on the 17th, so both teams in the final, so it works out really well, actually. OK, very good. We might start with the Racing game then. Racing against Saracens, 19 points to 15. For people who didn't see it, it I mean, the second half in particular felt very dramatic. It was 9-6 at the break to Racing. You suspect Saracens were happy enough. And then uh, Saris in kind of an Aviva-esque way against Leinster the previous week, kicked nine unanswered points, so it was 15-9. Machineau penalty makes it 15-12, and then Saris are hanging on. There's only four minutes to go when this happens. As you'll hear, French TV were pretty excited. Le petit jeu au pied, oui, le petit jeu au pied, Benoît Catawa par-dessus, qui contrôle ce ballon, il gonne, qui prend ce c'est fait, allez, allez, au but, au but, au but, au but, c'est fait, allez, bof, sur une inspiration de Finn Russell, un petit chip dans le dos pour Vakatawa, et l'essai libérateur, oh quel moment, there we are, un petit chip, I think I know what even that means. No, I think it's, it's such a disappointment if you've seen the images compared to what the guys on the radio are talking about. <laughs> uh, but it's, um, yeah, but I think you're, you're missing, for me, the key point is 15-9 and the ball kicked through by Lewington and he's 10 metres clear and he decides to pick it up. Yeah. But I think if we gave him another chance, uh, always you try and, uh, well, for me, the rule is basically you've got to keep kicking that and then plunging at in the, in the, over the try line. I, I think he didn't realise basically how much of an opportunity or guilt as chance he had. Um, but that happens in semi-finals when potentially it was probably this guy's uh, biggest game and biggest occasion. And that's sometimes what happens. You, you, you freeze when, when potentially for, for me, that was the game mm. because, um, with the quality of Russell, with the quality of Atakawa, 15-9, there's always that capacity to pull off um, what they did. And I think watching it, to be honest, 15-9, I thought it was up, and I thought Racing had accepted nearly the feat. They got a little bit of of a, an extra life by going 15-12, but for me, it seemed that Saracens were nearly in cruise mode at that stage. But uh, I know it's easy watching it, but you, you were nearly thinking why is the nine in the line? Why don't they have someone covering the chip line? Is there a message coming through there? And that's been, hindsight is a great selector, as they say, putting someone there. But that's, if you watch the score Racing got against Montpellier a few weeks previously, it's it's a similar try, but this try is better. But it's along the same lines because actually, without the cow catching it, there's a lot of skill involved. He, he, he isn't, it's not just a dink. He's actually started his run quite uh quite deep and he's at nearly full tilt catching the ball but then his capacity to 
to offload and push Wigglesworth away and then Finn Russell to accelerate through. And if you look at it closely, he nearly sticks uh, him off too much that the ball could have hopped off his shoulder. Juan has done really well to look at the ball and um, I suppose that's what makes it so so um, so fascinating sport because I thought the game was up. I genuinely did watching it. But, um, you know, it just meant so much to them. You could see at the full-time whistle, it was nearly like a, a celebration for... Um, a final victory, but as we know, after watching the the other semi final afterwards, uh, I suppose how confident, composed, uh, ruthless were Exeter, even I suppose uh, epitomised by uh, the interview of Baxter uh, during the game. You know that yeah, Toulouse are entitled to have purple patches. They're a serious team, but we're kind of backing ourselves at the back end of the game, and um, his words were extremely accurate. Mm. You just made an interesting point there about Saris. Maybe did you say they maybe had too many in the line, so they were liable to be done with that chip? Just, I didn't think there was a run threat, and I think that's probably um, just me analysing Rassen a bit because we play him this week. But they have a deadly uh, short kicking game along the lines of England. I think that's where they're probably ahead of international teams. I think their capacity, be it Slade, be it. Uh, Farrell, be it Ford, be it Daly, their be it Johnny May, their capacity to to push the ball into certain zones to pressurise teams is probably superior to a lot of other teams. But uh, you know the double combo of um, and it's not always Rus Russell uh, Vatikau, but it is for that chip play. Uh, but uh, Russell's attack and kick game is um, is very impressive. Mm. In general terms, you know, so I for instance I was watching the game alongside Shane Jennings and he was watching Racing and we're talking you know, cup rugby and everybody's under pressure and he didn't like some of their basics. For instance, he felt their ball presentation at times was just so sloppy. You know, he couldn't, especially in the first half, it was one of the reasons he felt they couldn't get momentum. But then, and, I'm, and this is more, more what I'm asking you about, in the second half, especially as they were behind, he felt that they were just doing silly things. There was one moment where Finn Russell tried to pass and, and he thought it was the wrong thing, thing to do because there was a penalty definitely coming. Or another example, they tried a trick line-out play in about 53 minutes when, you know, you kind of scream and just get the ball and do some basics right and, and really stress uh, Saris. What did you make of the way Racing went about their business in that second half when they went behind? I think that makes an interesting point because I think actually that's the difference between been suffocated by another team and been suffocated by a team that have such trust in each other like Saracens. We saw it the week previously against Leinster because you know how many tries do Leinster score? I know it may be in a different league and a far weaker league, but even in Europe over all the years, but like that's I think Saracens mentally and physically break you. And I thought felt at that stage that they had done that to Russell in the fact that he was um he was probably uh, put under pressure. He knew he would be, but I don't think the solutions were as forthcoming as he thought they may potentially be in the way he imagined or visualised the game. Uh, but credit to him, after 76 minutes, he still had the composure to pull it out of his, out of his cupboard. A really um, shrewd kick. But as you say, I think that's what happens when you play. I can remember... It was similar when we played England once or twice in the Aviv on a wet day. When England and English teams get on the front foot defending, uh, because you got to remember too, Joe, it's an indoor arena, it's a fast surface, it's incredibly good conditions for playing rugby. But like to complement Racing, uh, Saracens didn't score a try against them. And, uh, you know, the amount of quality that Saracens have, that's a fair achievement with a dry ball and a fast pitch, but flipping it around, I, you don't get many opportunities in this one. I think, for me, the game hinged on, and I'm from setting record, it never comes down to one moment, but after Saracens, I suppose, weathering uh, everything, Racing could throw at them and then keep them to, you know, nine points. Mm. It's a great job, but then uh, Lewington had the opportunity and, and, and it's harsh, but that's I think if you gave him that decision again, he continues to kick it on and he dives in it. Yeah, you'd be interested to see his reaction when he watches it back on TV. Did he realise what the full picture was? Maybe he didn't. What about Dunnock Ryan then, 37 years old, doing his thing and, and you know coming back from injury as well, didn't have minutes under the belt? Yeah, he's hard and he's solid and he's so intelligent. And, um, you know, I'd, you'd be delighted. It was three Irish guys in that club that, that have made a telling contribution and I think it's very important. Um, 
I'm, I probably mark that because I'd be delighted, obviously, for my friend, I guess, because he's a coach who has uh, done the hard yards and he's gone around the world or gone around the, you know, unfashionable clubs in France, shall we say. And now he's got his opportunity with a big, big super club and um, he's thriving in it. And, you know, I think we, his fairness to Zebo too, he was um, against Claremont. He, he did well and it was the second game back. And you, it's easy to get yourself up probably ready for the first game, but you got to come up against Saracens. You've one or two errors, but I think um, he has a great, I suppose, feeling and uh, link with a lot of his, with a lot of the players and they play for each other. They, they've got a great spirit there. Mm. Um, but also, I think it's, you got to remember too that Laurent Traver, who's a great manager, he's been there since 2013, Joe, and I know it's the third final in five years, but they haven't won one and um, it, it, it People, I suppose, in a, in the game, understand that like, getting to a final is one thing, but actually it's a big step in winning it. Mm. And I know you're going to say Exeter are inexperienced, but they've been the common team for a number of years as well. And, um, you know, with a difference in probably opinion or uh, rules about the salary cap, they could have been a lot more successful in terms of titles. They could have, and I think they feel that, you know, and any time Rob Baxter is interviewed, I think he feels that they've been robbed, really, and they should have, you know, have a totally different CV at the moment. Just uh, as we leave the, the Saracens' uh, performance, I don't think we've had you on since their win at the Aviva Stadium last uh, Saturday. What did you make of it then? Because, you know, they, there's been so much talk here, uh, various points made, you know, Leo Cullen talking about Leinster being spooked in the first half, uh, the similarities have been pointed out with the match in St James's Park in May 2019, the way Saracens beat Leinster there. And then obviously the, the parallels with England-Ireland games of late as well. So what struck you about this, this Saracens win in Dublin? Um, what struck me, I think, was the first 40 minutes. Um, what a complete performance of, uh, of rugby from, from Saracens in terms of... Usually it takes 60, 70, 75 minutes for you to, to break your opponent. But Saracens actually managed straight from the kickoff to get into their groove and just to keep their foot on Leinster's throat and keep going and keep going. I think to go in 22-3, um, I don't think anyone supporting Leinster or Leinster could have any complaints about that. It was exactly, uh, they played cup rugby, they played pressure rugby, I think, for anyone who questions the value of a box kick, you've got to look at what Wigglesworth does and how he kicks it and, and how effectively he kicks the ball. And uh, a kick is as good as his chase. And if you can catch the ball GA style over your head, it helps. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, the Dan Carter formula of repeating the simple things done well, um, Saracens tried in that. But also, I think what, I suppose, what not rocked me, but what really impressed me was... Um, the understanding of the rules by their players and understanding of um, what's a tackle, what's a rock. Um, I told you his tackle count, but also his decision-making around the tackle, around the rock. I don't think he conceded a penalty all day. His capacity to watch the ball in the defensive line, six metres from the line to intercept. You know, that's your second row coming up with big plays when his team needs it. He's coming in with um, mall tackle, you know, or choke tackles to, to enable them all. Uh, it, it's just, you can't give 22. And in fairness to Leinster, they, they had the chance to, to win the game or force extra time. Um, but 22-3 is just too big a lead yeah. to give a, a, champion, a champion's team. So fully accepting all your points about Saracen's brilliance, uh, Leinster are trying to pitch themselves at this standard. You know, they're going for a, a fifth star in the jersey. Well, they couldn't cope. What went wrong? What weren't they not doing? Um, well, started with probably not catching the kick off, and then um, they had a few um, um, what would be the word on customary errors. Then they, you know, essentially to get into the game, you need a, a functioning set piece, so their scrum let them down. So it's very hard to, to, to gain territory if you don't have a performing scrum or a, a scrum that can maintain parity. So that not alone sucks the territory out of you, but it also sucks uh, the spirit out of you because it's the biggest uh, mana, mana um, factor in rugby that still exists mm. because it's essentially eight against eight, one crushing someone else's intentions about 
and it's happened in the World Cup final, it happened in the in the Champions Cup semi final. So um, it's great to see that scrum is still alive, and people will say, "Well, was it refereed correctly?" Uh, I don't know because I don't understand or follow that domain. But uh, I think if you were a neutral, you'd have to say that the, certainly the Leinster scrum was not anywhere near dominant, mm. and it looked like that. Uh, Saracens made them suffer, and that's what great teams do. And then you've had Day, Elliot Daly, who can kick it from 60, and they maximise everything. But the score they tried, or the try they scored, was it was was a brilliant score as well. So it was a combination of simple rugby, deadly effective, but also ripping teams apart with the ball in hand as well. I just want to play a clip of Stuart Lancaster. He was out speaking to the media today, and so one of the things which has been discussed is the. England versus Ireland slash Leinster versus Sarri's dynamic and it's been the point has been made by lots of people that Irish teams at the moment are struggling with the power that English teams are bringing to the equation. So here's Stuart Lancaster answering that question today. I think it's probably too simplistic to say that personally. Um, it was not long ago Ireland were winning Grand Slams. We won the Pro Four. We won the you know, the European Cup um, uh, two years ago. The reality is, yeah, we've lost against Saracens twice now, and Ireland lost against England twice. Um, uh, I think the game in um, Newcastle um, was nip and tuck. I really think that, you know, we were 10-3 up um, uh, going into half-time. Obviously, they got that try just on half-time. We definitely had opportunities at the start of the second half. Um, and it was only when we lost Scott Friday to the bin, really, that they got the um, the momentum in the game and it gave us too much to do with, with the short, the short uh, time left on the clock. So... Um, you know, this, this game was different, I think, um, you know, this Leinster game. Uh, it's not, I mean, in four years I've been at Leinster, I've not seen us concede as many scrum penalties uh, in, in any game. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, I don't worry about things like that because I know we can fix those things up technically. Um, perhaps one or two things didn't go away that we felt should have done, but that's rugby, I guess. Um, uh, I think, I think um, you know, going on to the, the Ireland games and the England games that are coming around the corner, Ireland got more than enough in their armory to, to challenge England. Um, uh, I think it was probably more the kicking game, actually, in the last game, England-Ireland, that that, uh, that resulted in England getting that win. But the reality is, whether you play in Saracens or England, um, or the big teams, you know, in Europe, um, you have to do the fundamentals really well. And on the day, you know, we didn't do that well enough, and that was the reason Saracens won. So that's Stuart Lancaster there. I mean, you, you can't really disagree with much of that. And obviously, it's simplistic to put it down to one thing, whatever that one thing is. But the power issue is still an issue. Like he mentioned uh, the Grand Slam one in Paddy's day in 2018, Ronan. Fact remains, there was no Billy Vunipola that day. There was no Tui Laggy that day. I had a look back. The English back row was Rob Shaw, Haskell and Simmons. You know, if we're going from 2019 on, it does feel like the power game is an issue. Well, especially with the individuals you mentioned, some of them are are un, unmarkable and and incredibly good players like two well Aggies, a bloody hard man to stop yeah. no matter what you say yeah. with their line out rules you got to be 10 meters back off a scrum it's back line against back line he's a hard man to chop tackle Billy Vinopal off the back of a scrum he's going to get on the front foot but I, I think and I agree with Stuart I, I think what happened for 80 minutes in the semi or sorry in the quarter final the Saracens play players played better than the Leinster guys in their in their head to head duels but that's sometimes um, that's for that eighty minutes, Joe. You know, I think it's it's it would be for me completely inaccurate to make a sweeping general comment in that regard because it's the eighty minutes you're judged on, and there is a definitely a power issue with with the guys you mentioned there. But you look at the damage that um, Underhill and um, um, Curry uh, Curry did at the World Cup. You know, they're they're not. They're, they're not um, physical players. They're just incredibly smart and have huge engines on them. Mm. But it's also a case of like how many errors when Leinster had the ball or high balls against Saracens the last day, they would be probably disappointed with their own, I suppose, skill set in that on that day. But I think, you know, if you look at it from the Newcastle game, and as Stuart said, there was an opportunity maybe for Ringrose to kill the game for Leinster to beat Saracens that day. And he put his hand up and he was... Uh, very manly about it, and mm. he said if he had that chance back again, he would have delivered the pass. And, and do, you, do you agree? Do you agree that Leinster were right in that game, that that in Newcastle that game? game? Yeah. You do absolutely. Okay. Well, sure. Well, because a on the scoreboard and b mentally and being physically watching the game in the Aviva for me for forty minutes, 
Um, there was one team in the game. And then, in fairness to Leinster with their character, they responded really well. But, um, they, you know, 19 points is too much at this level. Yeah. But you could say there was probably an opportunity maybe not to play from deep when I think it was at um, Armour. Larmer forced an offload that the ball came out. That's a huge release of pressure, especially yeah. against the Saracens team that just knew that they needed to get one key score, a drop goal to get to put them out of, out of range. You mentioned the errors there. Like it's an interesting thing, isn't it, when we're talking about uh, a very talented bunch, this Irish bunch who've been in big games and won big games, and you can think of how many games of late where we're seeing really silly errors slipping in you know yeah, like, like I suppose Joe that's a long time too when a long time ago Ireland have won big games so, so sorry yes yeah, so the, 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 the point I was going to kind of put to you is uh, we can no longer say this is a group that don't make errors you know under Schmidt at their best it was like geez there's just the errors were there's practically zero unforced errors in this team they're razor sharp their discipline is part of that and now you're seeing like it's not it, you can't even call them uncharacteristic at times anymore you're just seeing errors way too often over the last 18 months, and I don't know why that's happened. Well, it was November 2018 when Ireland destroyed, destroyed might be too strong, but Ireland clinically outperformed New Zealand. Yes, clinical is the that, word, yeah. That, that, was, that was the peak. Um, but the graph is downward since then, but that's in sporting parlance, that's a long time ago. Hmm. You're coming up to two years, 24 months. So, you so, know so why, why the errors? Why the, you know, Johnny Sexton's restarts in the Principality Stadium, you know, and, and we saw a restart again at the weekend. Why the knock-ons? Why, why is all that here? Whatever about other teams analysing Ireland and doing their homework in Ireland and, and blocking uh, runners from a box kick and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the errors. Just the execution seems to have dipped. Well, that's what pressure does to you too, I think, you know, in big games like that. But we're, 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 we're saying they've managed big games in the past. Yeah, they have, they have. And, you know, I, I wasn't aware of Johnny's error in the in the millennium, but that was very uncharacteristic, to be fair, from like his, his kicking basics are very, very strong. Mm. Uh, but for him, he'd be the most disappointed when he knows that, like, that that just can't happen in a game like that when, when you need the leaders or the leader standing up but that's that's what Saracens do to you they they put you in a place where your brain can't cope yeah. hence you come you probably said I've done this restart a thousand times and you take your eye a tiny little bit off so you put it down so to Saras Saracens pressure or if it's internationally English pressure Saracens have a have a have a um, on the pitch they are serious competitors, Joe. I would think that, uh, well, watching the game, they squeezed Leinster, and as Leo said, they got spooked. But mm. before they got spooked, I think they were absolutely rattled. Mm. But that's what happens in a big game. Like, it's a game of cat and mouse at times, but the, the game of cat and mouse in this instance didn't last very long because it was Saracens, Saracens, Saracens. Usually, it's three points each mm. one scored and the other team replies but yeah. it was just a flurry of punches thrown by Saracens that Leinster couldn't get out of. I'm not sure when the Irish players became the mouse is the interesting thing though. You know even the World Cup review there was talk of the mental preparation not being strong enough. You just wonder like they're not executing across well, that's the that's a different I think to be it all together. I think the World Cup as we've discussed on air many a time mm. the World Cup preparation cycle I don't think for me what was interesting in this game is that it's a club game, but it's a lot of international players playing a club game. Yes. While English and French teams, for example, would be, uh, you know what I mean, there's 14 whatever teams in both countries, but in Ireland there's four teams out of that, those guys play for the national team. Mm. So, um, you know what I mean, it's a, you don't really have a lot of clubs in England or France loaded with international players. You have a selection of overseas and French internationals. But, uh, and France, all, the, all the more reason that Leinster should cope, you know, if they're internationals and they're used to big games. Um, I don't know, I haven't, yeah, I haven't, I I haven't heard a great explanation yet from anyone, to be honest. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're absolutely knocking my last 20 minutes work, John. <laughs> <laughs> no better, man. 
But look, I mean, I'm, I'm teasing it out, I'm testing what you're saying, and then, like, because it's, it's interesting, you know, and I don't quite know what, why the shift Which has sure, happened. Like, if that's the case, then you can program the robots. But Correct, like, yeah. I think, you know, maybe that's another debate for itself in another day, how, like, the mu movement general, as they call in France, or the structured play versus the unstructured play. But mm. look how structured and simple Saracens play, but how effective is it? Because you get buy-in from every single person. It's knowing their role, doing their role, and actually, uh, you know what I mean, resetting, playing the next moment, reset, yeah. play the next moment. But that's that's average if it's 8 out of 15 doing it or 8 out of 23. But if you can get the 15 guys doing that, mm. it becomes very powerful. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's very hard to achieve that. Sure, I'm sure it is. So very, very last one. I've gone over time here. That's, that's my fault. Sorry. Very last question as, then. As usual. <laughs> uh, Andy Farrell has to go to Twickenham then. So, uh, key things you'd like to see from an Irish team in Twickenham? I think going to Twickenham excites every Irish rugby player. You, the supporters, you m may dread that occasion, but I can guarantee you if you're, if you're a player in an Irish green jersey, there's no bigger test and there's no better stadia, st stadium to go test yourself in. No, I get uh, that, but they'll, they'll have memories of the last day, which wasn't good. So how do they prevent that happening? I don't think they will. No? Uh, um, rugby players are, are very good at wiping the slate and kind of focusing on the seven-day process in terms of what's ahead of them. Right. Uh, you know, you can't be dwelling on the past because, as you say, you know, as you said, or was, sorry, as I said, 2018 against the uh, All Blacks is like an, an eternity ago. It's a long, long time ago. you got to stay in the know. Um, but it'll be an opportunity for a lot of guys because I think, as we've seen, there are lots of places up for grabs on the Irish team and we won't get into that sure. uh, discussion tonight, but it, it makes for so much to play for for a lot of players and with obviously um, the situation, uh, I suppose the negativity around the whole game at the minute, it, it, it makes for, for, um, for interesting um, time for everyone. It does. Well, there's France away in the meantime as well. So, look, we'll pick it up again and then we'll, we'll throw the ball around a little bit. Ron Nagar, brilliant stuff. Thanks so much. Thanks, Joe. Great to chat. Thank you. For all the hardship that he's gone through, for all the naysayers that said, you know, he'd never win a major, he needed to get fit, he needed to do this, he needed to do that. He's proven all right. He started this final round leading by four. Play so well for three days, you have a four-shot lead. Now you're going to lose. It'll take some time to get it's over. It's not easy to get yourself in a position I got myself in today, and I was there for the taking, and I didn't take it. Um, but you can only learn from your mistakes. Yeah, they're talking about my drop down the world rankings and talking about all that, but I'm not. I'm not alarmed. 90s in the world at the minute. I mean, is it disastrous? Not really. You know what I mean? So, like, I remember being the happiest man alive when I broke into the top 100 a couple of years ago. This so. is to become the 2009 three Irish Open champion. And he's done it.